As you can tell, I'm feeling way better than I was last week. So those of you who are asking, uh, it was a terrible, terrible weekend last week. But I feel much better now. And we are getting back to normal. Last week, we did kick off our series on, uh, through the Lenten series as we're taking a look at the temptation of Jesus and his time in the wilderness as he prepared for his ministry. But all of that begins with the baptism of Jesus as we journey through our series Overcome. The baptism of Jesus does not launch Jesus to his heavenly throne. It doesn't take him or lead him to the good and easy places of this world. The baptism of Jesus leads him into the wilderness. You see, I think if we stop sort of at the words, this is my son with whom I love and with him I am well pleased, I think a lot of people would be more than willing to jump on to the Christian faith. But it takes us deeper. Baptism and our baptism, when we share in it with Jesus, does not necessarily always lead us to the easy. It doesn't always lead us to the good places. Sometimes it leads us into the wilderness. Jesus is led into the wilderness, and so are we. We open our Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4, reading verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we pray this morning that you would write your word on our hearts, that we would understand what it means to follow you and to the call that you have placed on our lives. When we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the devil that we may Strengthen us, O God. We might lean on you and your word. In the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. So we're in the stage of life that many of you have told us over and over and over again not to wish away as parents. And there's a truth to that. And there are wonderful parts of this stage that we're in as parents where, you know, I realize that the day will come when my three-year-old does not want to walk up and sit on the couch with me and kind of snuggle into me. And that moment, I cherish that, right? There are that, that moment when they want you to lay with them in bed as they're falling asleep. And, it, you know, those are the moments as a parent that you know, and hopefully further away than it is right now, that they're going to stop asking you to do those things. The day will come. And so those moments, there's some truth to the to what you guys have shared with us to not wish that away. But then there are other moments. <laughs> moments like an Ash Wednesday service that is beautiful and contemplative that that uh, got me in, into a very spiritual place myself. And then you walk into your office and you have a text from your wife that says, "Come home, throw up everywhere." <laughs> So you go home, and babies are crying, and kids are sick, and you lay them down to bed, and you walk out in the hallway, and there are just towels laying on the floor. And so for two hours, while you're scrubbing the carpet on your hands and knees and cleaning up throw up, you're wondering about those people who tell you not to wish this time away, if they'd be willing to take a phone call at 9.30 at night to come over and help you clean the carpet. It was so bad, this is not a joke, I went out and bought a carpet cleaner the next day. <laughs> you see, it's in that moment where you go, ah, that Snickers commercial, that the want to get away question, yes. Yes, I do. The wilderness sounds like a wonderful place at that moment. You see, it isn't because I don't love my family. I love them more than they'll ever know. It isn't because I don't love the church. I love this place. I love our church. I love what God is doing in us and through us. And yet, we have these moments in our lives where we want to wish things away. Where the wilderness, it sounds like a wonderful place, doesn't it? You see, we live in this culture, in this world, where we have pressures coming at us from every direction to be this, to live this way, to be this kind of thing. And what we ultimately end up is in survival mode. I was talking with somebody not too long ago. They were lamenting the kind of culture that we live in, that parents today, this is what they said, parents today just aren't as committed as we were. 
an interesting way to look at the world. It's just that the world is different. It isn't a commitment issue, it's an overcommitment issue. We have commitments here, 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 and here. We have everything and everyone pulling for our time all of the time. And we feel overstretched and overburdened. And that idea of wanting to get away sounds like a wonderful thing. See, in this kind of different culture that we're living in today, as much as the world has shifted, we have more pressures and mounting pressures, more stresses, and we end up in survival mode. We end up in these moments and in the season where all we really want to do is make it through the end of the day. Laura and I have this conversation almost daily. As soon as the twins are finally asleep, we survive. <laughs> Survival mode is a necessary thing in our lives. It's a necessary thing in, in seasons of our lives and in days, moments where we just need to get to the end of the day. But the problem is, is that for many of us, survival mode has become our operating way of life. And when that happens, because in survival mode, we're, we're selfish survival mode, we're thinking about how we're going to get to the end, we're thinking about just conquering the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, we lose a vision for what our life really is. And in survival mode, because we're looking at ourselves, we actually lose a vision or understanding of what our purpose is or why we're here. And in many ways, in survival mode, we end up in the wilderness. Even though we're surrounded by people and we're surrounded by community, we end up feeling isolated and alone because we lose our sense of community because we're just trying to make it. wilderness in scripture is used over and over and over again as a literal and figurative symbol of what it means to be in chaos. See, God, when he shows up and calls Abraham out of his father's land, out of the land of Ur, he calls him to go to the promised land. Go to the land that I'll show you, he says. But in order for Abraham to get to the promised land, in order for Abraham to live in to what God had promised would come through him, Abraham has to travel through the wilderness. Remember the story of Moses. When Moses is called by God to lead God's people out of slavery, he does. In this amazing way that the Red Sea splits open. But you know, as they walk through the Red Sea, free from Pharaoh and from slavery, where do they end up? Not in the promise, but in the wilderness. And it's there for 40 years they will wander wilderness, shaped and formed by God in that season, learning to trust in Him as they walk toward the promise. They can't get the promise without the wilderness. The wilderness is different than the city. You see, the city is a place of protection. In the Old Testament, the city had walls around it, and those walls protected you from predators on the outside and from en enemies on the outside. In the city, you have uh, a place to live, a roof over your head to protect you from the elements. You know where your food is coming from. You know what life would be like. It's predictable. It's none. But the wilderness? The wilderness is unpredictable. The wilderness makes you vulnerable. You're vulnerable to predators. You're vulnerable to enemies. Your next meal is not so known. The wilderness is a difficult, difficult place. It's chaos. It's unknown. And because of that, we spend a good portion of our time trying to avoid it. No. See, we understand the wilderness. We understand that idea of vulnerability. We understand that idea of not feeling safe or protected, of understanding that something out there is dangerous. The wilderness is often a scary and unforgiving place. And so we spend a good portion of our time and energy trying to figure out how to not be in it. Wilderness is a necessary place. Many 
think that baptism provides for us some kind of protection or insurance. I deal with this all the time as a pastor. When, I, when parents come in for the first time and, and ask for a baptism, I always say, well, why do you want your kids to be baptized? About 50% of the time, I hear a phrase somewhere along the lines, in case anything bad happens, we want them to be protected. I'm sorry, but I don't have magic fingers, and this is not magic water. Our baptism is not in a protection plan to keep us out of the wilderness. And if you want any idea of where the prosperity gospel should end, it should end right here in the Gospel of Matthew, when we read that Jesus and his baptism, a spirit comes down from heaven and God speaks, This is my Son, whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. And last week we said when we share in Jesus' baptism, God speaks those words into our lives. But you see, there's... The story that continues. Then, Matthew says, then Jesus is led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness. Not to his heavenly throne, not to the good and awesome places of the world. Like you would think in baptism, Jesus was led to a party where they celebrated and had cake because he was baptized, right? Isn't that what we do? God, that's what we do. <laughs> baptism. When God speaks those words, with him I am well pleased, then the Spirit of God led him into the wilderness. The prosperity gospel says that if God is pleased with you, that God will bless you. Right here, we see at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, I'm pleased with you. Now go into the wilderness. Go into the place of vulnerability. Go into the difficult moments, into the hard places of this world. Because there I am sending you. The scary, the unknown, to the unpredictable. We spend so much time trying to avoid the wilderness we actually forget that in God's story of redemption, it's the wilderness that shapes and forms his people for his mighty work in the world. See, because in the wilderness, we have to realize our own weakness. We have to realize that we are vulnerable, and then we have to understand that we have to trust in God. Just as the Israelites, they, they in the wilderness, wanted to go back to slavery because it was so scary. Because at least there they had food, and what did God do but send manna from heaven to feed his people? They had to learn to trust in God. This whole season of Lent is shaped in the wilderness. That what we do in this season is remember that Jesus himself went there. It was led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness where he will be tempted by the devil. Now we might read that and assume that God is tempting Jesus, but he's not. Dale Brinner says in his commentary that God would not have sent Jesus into the wilderness if God did not believe that Jesus could take the wilderness. He's not there led by God into temptation. He's led by God into the wilderness, and there the devil is waiting. Don't you think that Satan understands the place of vulnerability? It's the place where he can do his best work. The word here used by Matthew is diablo. It's a Greek word, diablo. And at the root of diablo means to split the definition of the word, to split. When we think of the devil, we think of Satan, we don't talk about him too much, but when we think about Satan, we usually think about this red face, horn, you know, black goatee, black cape, I do at least, because when I was growing up, we put on a passion play at our church. And in that passion play, when Jesus was in the tomb, devil rules the earth, right? And so they brought out this scariest looking person as possible to try to scare you and trying to think about who this, this Satan figure, this devil was. 
Now, I'm not quite sure where we get that image, but when I use that image, all of you get it, right? You all understand. But there's no image of that devil, that Satan, that Diablo in Scripture. So I'm not quite sure where we get it from, but that's how we understand it. My guess is that the devil has never showed up in your life that way. If he did, we probably need to talk after church. <laughs> the devil has probably never showed up in your life as a red-faced, horned, black cave, scary-looking person with an evil laugh. Because that's not who Scripture points us to. See, the devil shows up in a whisper. <clears throat> devil shows up at the split. The one who moves us away from the purposes that God has created and made us for. The devil isn't some red-faced horned figure roaming around on this earth. The devil is an evil force. According to scripture, the devil is an anti-God. That anti-God's sole purpose is to break us away from the purposes that God has made us for, to split us. Martin Luther wrote about the devil that his primary objective in this world is to convince us away from God's word and God's work in this world. anti-God, who splits us from our purpose. It's easy for us to think that the devil doesn't exist. It's easy for us to think that evil out there isn't real. But then you don't have to look too far. Just flip on the news and you begin to see evil rearing its ugly head in this world. that comes to divide and to see. You see, friends, it's the splinter that speaks into your mind and into your heart and into your soul that you are not worthy of love. That you've done too many bad things to receive his grace. It's the splitter that tells you and whispers into your mind and heart that just a little more money, just a couple more things, just a little more respect, and I'll finally be happy. It's the splitter that convinces us that the grass is greener over there. If I just go over there, no matter what the outcome is around the people around me, if I just go over there, I'll be happy. That's the voice of the split. It's the splitter who says that those addictions that have gripped your heart and your life to drugs or to alcohol or to pornography, they're not that bad. They're not hurting anyone. It's a victimless crime. I have it under control. I could let it go if I wanted to. The splitter. The splitter who enters into Adam and Eve's world not as a red faced, horned devil, but in the whisper of a snake that says, You can be just like God. You can be Lord of your life. And God is holding you back. just take this, you'll be just like him, and he doesn't want you to be that. See, it's the voice of the splitter that pulls us away, that tempts us away from what we were created for. It's the voice of the splitter that tells us the created is better than the creator. 
<laughs> a few years ago, I was having a conversation with somebody. <clears throat> They've done some pretty terrible things in their life. Don't worry, it's nobody in this church, so I'm not talking about you. I know some of you are like, I'm talking about me. It's not you. And it's not your neighbor. You know what they said to me? Their life had been, been a wave of destruction. They said, well, the devil really got a hold of me and made me do some pretty terrible things. And I looked them in the face and I said, that's a lie. Because if God can't affect our free will, the free will that he's created us for and our, us with, if God, the God of the universe, created us with this free will that he can't affect, then why would he give that power to Satan? Do not use the devil, do not use the splitter as a surrogate for your responsibility for the things that you do or don't do. The devil can't make you do anything. You have a choice. You have a choice to follow and lean on God's word or to give in to the tempter, the splitter who whispers into our lies that the created is better than the creator, who tries to tempt us away from the image of God that is in each and every one of us, from who God has called us and made us to be. Don't give in to the splitter. Jesus will show us the way to overcome. The world out there wants to convince us that we have the power and strength in here, deep in our gut. But you see, that's what this glitter wants us to think. Jesus will teach us the way to overcome is to lean on the very word of God and to follow him. First time I went skiing, I was 19 years old. I was with my dad and my oldest brother. Now, I should have learned throughout the course of my life, because I was 19, not to trust my oldest brother. <laughs> I never learned that lesson. Probably still to this day, I haven't learned that lesson. I picked up on skiing rather quickly, and... Um, but I gotta tell you, you know, there's something about that sport where you strap boards to your feet and go down slick surfaces that makes you a little scared. Like, this is kind of crazy that people do this. And I remember this because I remember going up the chairlift and it was going up a black diamond. And those who aren't familiar with skiing, black diamonds are the steepest and fastest hills. They're the hardest hills. A lot of them say experts only, you know, and it's my first day. So I remember going up the ski lift, looking at the steepness of the hill going, you guys are nuts. I am not doing that. Now, as the day progressed and I got better, my brother, my dad went in for the night. My brother and I, we stayed out skiing. Now, I just had to follow him because I didn't know where I was going. I didn't really know what I was doing. And we go over the crest of this hill, and it's very steep, and I stopped. Not well, but I stopped. And now I'm, I'm mad. <laughs> My brother took me to the very place that I told him I don't want to go. When I told him that, Franklins are kind of confrontational people. I don't know if you picked up on that. <laughs> so I told him that. In wonderful big brother fashion, he turned to me and he said, Steve, you can do this. I wouldn't have brought you here if you could. Now, if you don't want to do it, the only way down is to walk. So take off your skis and start walking. Well, I sure wasn't walking, I can tell you that. Because we were already sort of past the point of no return. And so I, I went. I didn't fall. It wasn't pretty. I can tell you those two things. Now, a few weeks ago, I was out skiing that hill. Like nothing. It's easy. So I had this fear of this place that I didn't want to be, and I didn't want to go. But because I trusted my brother, whether I should or not is irrelevant, but because I trusted him, I went. I did. The wilderness. 
this is a place we try to avoid. When we trust God to lead us there, even if we don't want to go, that it might shape and form us to be who God has made us to be. That we can do more than we realize, not because we have the power within because we trust in the one who has conquered it all. In his baptism, Jesus is mightily blessed by the hand of God. That mighty blessing leads him into the wilderness. There he will be mightily tempted. He doesn't overcome because he is the son of God. That's the easy act. He overcomes because he relies on the word of God. When we follow him, you see, in our baptism, we are given this identity marker, this foundational thing that says, You, you are a child of God. And when that happens, the splitter wants to take hold of it to move you away from the purpose that he has made you for. Will you follow God into the wilderness? Lean and trust in him. Knowing that it's there, the tempter will find you. Friends, we can overcome. We can overcome the trials that we face, the temptations that are before us, the sins that have gripped us. But we won't do it alone. And we go into the wilderness, leaning and trusting on the very word of God. Dale Brenner says that Jesus is caught between the bodies. He's led by the Spirit, where he's tempted by the, by the Spirit. This is the story of our lives. We're led by the Spirit. From there, the splitter will whisper his voice into our hearts, into our minds, into our souls. You can overcome. It's trust in the very word of God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now stand on the front of people.